turn with me to the book of John, chapter 8. I'm going to be reading a portion of scripture out of here. Um, if you guys can put up that picture that I sent to you in the first one. That would be great. Don't do it. I'm sure I don't have to explain to you what this is. I'm sure you won't know. But this is lightning. Lightning storm. Beautiful, power, dangerous. In a fraction of a second, lightning heats up the air around it to an incredible temperature as hot as 54,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about 30,000 degrees Celsius. A typical lightning flash is about 300 million volts and about 30,000 amps. In comparison to a household current, which is about 120 volts and 15 amps. Striking around 270,000 miles per hour, lightning has enough power to be able to split a tree in half or even kill someone. Each year, about 400 people in the United States are struck by lightning while working or playing outside, and about 50 people are killed and several hundred more left to cope with permanent disabilities. A recent analysis found that a single flash of lightning along the northern Gulf Coast spanned 477 miles across, breaking a world record. This mega flash of lightning lit up an area stretching from Texas to Mississippi. Lightning is very powerful and to me, very beautiful. I'd love to actually just sit there and just listen to all the, the thunder clapping outside and just seeing the flashes of lightning. But lightning can light up the darkest of places at night for it is a powerful light in the darkness of night. The reason I'm using that is to use as a comparison to God, to Jesus, for he is our light in the darkness, our light in the darkest of places. And so I want to read out of our main scripture where he says this himself. If you can read along with me, John 8, 12, it says, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Now, the title of my sermon is called The Power of Light in Darkness. My first point being without light. Now, I could have used a lamp as the illustration of light, but as I said, the reasoning for lightning instead is not only because it's lightning a large source of light, but it is very powerful and very beautiful, much like our God, who has so much power to be able to create our entire world with just a thought, but yet he is also very beautiful. And we need his light to be able to navigate through the darkness of life. Now, the question that could pop into your mind is, well, why would I need his light during the day? I mean, there's the sun, and even at night, we have our lampposts, we have our flashlights, we have our cell phone. Well, that's true in the natural realm of things, in the natural world, the physical world. But when Jesus says that he is the light of the world, he's not talking about just this physical world. He's talking about spiritually within us. For that darkness that is being referred to is our sin. That sin is within everyone in this place. It's within yeah. you, it's within me, the person next to you, everyone, within the entire world. There is darkness. And we were born within this darkness. And we continually are in this darkness without God's light. If we do not call out to his light. But you see, the darkness doesn't just come up right behind you, you know, cover your eyes, it's like, guess who? No. Darkness. <laughs> darkness surrounds us completely. Everywhere we look, that's where it is. It shrouds us in its mystery to where we have no ability to see where we are going. But we're not just standing still. We are going somewhere. The darkness is leading us to a path. For Jesus says that we won't have to walk in the darkness. So there is a path that is being led for us. Just not one that we should be taking. It's one that the darkness is taking us to, that our sin is taking us to. Now, we walk in blindness, in blindness, and this sin is going to maneuver us to places away from God's light, whether that be to the casino to go and gamble, whether that be to the bar to go and get drunk, or even to that one guy or girl that's going to eventually lead us to sexual immorality. That's where it's going to lead us, to this happiness that it promises us. Anywhere to keep us away from God. But without his light, we are lost. We cannot see where we are going. For this path that we are taking, we don't realize this. Right in front of us, there is a ditch that we are going to eventually fall into. For even the Bible says that this sin, this happiness will last only for a season. 
Now, once we fall into this ditch, we fall out of that happiness. And this ditch that we're in is sorrow, is pain, is rejection, depression, anger, condemnation, weapons that the devil will use against us at that moment. And if we believe in all of that, that moment, we are in the devil's trap. We are in his grasp. He has a hold of us. To a point that we start to believe all hope is lost. Our life is meaningless. There's no reason for us to even live. And if we give in to all of this, that devil will have us and eventually bring us into his hell. But all of that is just a simple lie of the devil. For Jesus says in John 8, 44, it says, For you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do evil things as he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it consists with the character that he has, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now, in this moment, Jesus is speaking to the Jews, but we can apply this to ourselves because, as I said, we are born within this darkness. We are nurtured from the very moment we were birthed in this darkness, in this sin. As a child, you are sinning. You will lie just to get that food, that comfort that you want, even just in your cries. All the way from the beginning, we are in sin. We believe we're happy. We believe in the devil's light and happiness. And if we just continue to follow that, we're following in the devil's plan. For his end goal is to be able to bring us into his hell. And when he does that, it's just another point on his scoreboard because all it is to him is just a game. He doesn't believe in us. He doesn't want us to go anywhere. Just to his hell so that he can just sit there and be like, I got another one. And I got another one. Make another tally on his scoreboard. But in order to get out of this ditch, we have to be able to listen to God. He's calling out to us. We just need to be able to allow ourselves to hear him. That's where my second point comes in, of hearing his voice. And Jesus meant what he said when he said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have light that leads to life. He is the light. We don't have to walk in the darkness. We can follow him, follow his light. How do we do that? How do we find Jesus? How do we find his light? Well, that's where things get misinterpreted through time. We don't find Jesus. He's not the one that's lost. We're the one that's lost. He's looking for us. He's calling out to us. We are the one lost sheep that the shepherd has left his 99 to go look for, to bring back to the 99, to make that 100. He's calling out to us, but the only reason why we do not hear him is because we're stiff-arming him. We're saying, no, I know where I'm going. I don't need you. And we are just ignoring his calls, his calls of hope. It's like playing a game where there's this game, you have a blindfold on, and you have a partner who's telling you the path to go. But in that moment, we could be saying, I don't need to hear you. I know where I'm going. Trust me. I know exactly where I'm going. I looked at the layout before I put the blindfold on. <laughs> and then you're walking, and you hit that low-hanging branch and fall flat on your back, and you just look like an idiot. That's literally what it is. We're just falling for the trap that's ahead of us, we're gonna fall for against our pride. Our pride is gonna lead us to stupidity. But Jesus said, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. So we are the one that is lost. We're the ones lost in darkness and he's trying to call out to us. The only way that we will be able to actually hear him, the only way we'll be able to actually see that light is if we put down our pride we lay it down and we allow ourselves to just listen. And we'll just hear him. For in Matthew 13, 9, he says, He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. This sentence has been repeated multiple times in scripture for one reason. That reason is because we need to be able to listen to him. We need to be able to hear him. If we don't allow ourselves to, we'll stay in that darkness. But if we do, that's when we'll start seeing the light. My third point, last point here is walking in the light. If we allow that light to be able to enter into our lives, that darkness will tremble. It will flee. As one of the songs says that in Jesus' name, demons will flee. That is the same thing. With his light, that darkness will flee. But just like every light source, there is still a shadow that is casted. The darkness is still there trying to surround us. But in the moment of light, when we lay down our lives, we come to this altar and we repent and say, God... Forgive me of my sins. I'm putting down my pride and I want you to enter into my life. Will that light be able to enter into us? And we'll get up so excited wanting to bring as many people to it to experience that light itself because it's just so exhilarating. However you say the word. 
But the Bible says as well that my cup will run over. When we experience that light, the blessings will come along with it. We will start to see those blessings. We'll start to see the prosperity that God will bring to us just because we listen to his word, just because we're allowing ourselves to experience that light. But as I said, that darkness will still so try to surround us because that light is like a fire. We have to maintain it. We have to just keep it flowing. We have to treat it. If we don't allow ourselves to treat it by praying, by reading, by hearing the word of God within the church, surrounded by our people, that fire will eventually go out and the darkness will eventually surround us once again. Those are just the basic things to keep this light. But Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. He is the way, the path, the guide to eternal life, everlasting life. But we will go through trials and tribulations. The darkness, again, will try to take us down. I have one last illustration that I'm going to use. Many years ago, my brother was hospitalized because he couldn't breathe that well. The reason being for that, they found out, was that both his lungs had collapsed. And in that moment, it was the hardest time for me and my parents because the doctor said, because of his condition, he may not be able to make it. Now, for those of you who don't know my brother, he was born with, a, or he was diagnosed with a disability called cerebral palsy. So where the doctor said that his mind had stopped developing and that he has a mind that of a four month old. So because of these conditions, because of his medical conditions of his seizures and just his medical history and all that, they said he wouldn't be able to survive. And if he did, it would take about a week or longer to be able to recover. And so my parents were praying, they were crying out to God in this dark moment. But in this moment, I was six years old and God reached out and used me to go to my parents. And I walked up to my parents, I don't even remember any of this. My parents told me the story. And I told my parents, I said, after seeing my brother, I said, He'll be okay. God is going to heal him. You'll see. Just watch. And of course they took that, but at the same time, you know, it's just this little six-year-old. Sometimes you believe them, sometimes you don't. <laughs> Even if God is using them. But so at that time, my mom went home. She went to go get some rest before coming back to the hospital. And the doctors came to go grab me and my father. And they said, come with me, for he's awake. And we, we went over there. My mom came back to the hospital, and she went to the room that he was at, and she freaked out because he wasn't there. She went to the nurse and was asking, like, where is my son? And they told her, they said, oh, he's not here in the ICU anymore. He's in one of the regular rooms. He's Man. just being monitored. And come to find out, when my mom walks in, he is lively. He is smiling like nothing ever happened. Within two hours, of me saying that he would be okay. His lungs came back to perfect condition to the point that they looked like nothing even happened. Amen. Amen. Within 24 hours, he was back home. Wow. You can put up that last picture that I sent. This is my family and I. My brother was the one on the left in the wheelchair. He is now 30 years old. Back when he was diagnosed with that condition, Back when he was diagnosed with that condition of cerebral palsy, they told my parents he would not be able to live past 82. 30 years old. It's crazy to believe that God's power, because of our faith, because of our belief in him, as long as we trust him, these are the things that he'll do. Man. Even in those darkest moments, when the darkness comes to try to take us down, we just have to say, no, I am not listening to you because I trust my God because of my faith, because of what God's power is. I will never go back to those things. I will never lose hope. My life is not meaningless because God has a path set before us. We oh, have yeah, a path lined up before us. Yeah. Yes. As long as we're willing to gain that light, as long as we're able to maintain the light, we will be able to reap the blessings that come along with it. Now I'm done. Yeah. <laughs>